Um, hi, it's Michelle from Lion Out Studio. I decided just to do a little video for you, just something simple like painting an apple. If you can paint an apple, you can paint anything else. So I thought this was something nice and simple to start with. Um, just setting it up, making my layers using the rectangle tool in Procreate is really good for that. And I'm just trying to get the table and the um, backdrop to the apple in place. Now I've grabbed my thick and thin pencil. It's out of my Procreate portrait pack. And that's mostly what I'll use is my portrait pack for this image. Just sketching the apple now. Just on one layer on top of this rest of the stack. Um, it's, yeah, it's, look at the shapes, that's really the main thing. Um, be guided by your eye, look at one shape in relation to another shape. Look at the negative space in between, like the um, stem, the negative space that it creates. And use your eye to just guide you. It's all digital, so we've got all these great tools that we can erase, we can move things, we can use liquify. That's why we use digital, to help our workflow, to help us in production. There's no cheating involved. It's not cheating. It's just simply using tools that are at our disposal. Like you do in any other medium. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's traditional. If there's shortcuts and things that can help you achieve what your finished piece is, go for it. I'm still doing the shapes. You can just see... I'm just cleaning it up as much as possible. Making sure that, you know, everything's pretty right. I don't, yeah, I don't use the sketch at the end of it. The outlines aren't used in my finished piece, so it doesn't need to look perfect. I'm a really messy sketcher, so... It doesn't matter. It all becomes edges at the end of it anyway. Now you see I've, the reference picture that I've used, I've changed to grayscale. This is so we can start in grayscale and you can learn to get your values right first and we'll add colour to it after. Just look at the colours, look at the values. Um, relation to one another it doesn't have to be perfect but get it as close as possible choose a average color the base color for your apple the base color for your stem the base color for the leaves this is the average color of what it would be without any shadow or light on it really that's what you're going for Every component has its own layer. I'm keeping them separate. Probably wouldn't normally do so for something simple like this. I'd probably just do it all on one layer. But I'm trying to show you the process so that you can then go off and apply it to more complex things as well. Everything is observation that I'm doing total observation. Look at the edges, look at the shadow, how it bleeds out and starts to fade at the edges. So I just used a soft round eraser and to soften that edge. Um, this brush I'm about to use now, it's a big texture 
brush. I'm just using it to create a bit of texture on the back wall behind the apple. Not that I'm adding a lot of details yet, it's just giving it a base. I'm working through layer after layer. Next I'll do the front of the table, bench, whatever it's on. Just add a little bit of the texture that's in there. And when I do a layer, I add a clipping mask. So a clipping mask on top of each layer. That way I don't have to worry about going outside the edges. It's all easy. So now I'm starting to add the darks to the apple. Looking at the values carefully, looking at the shadows where they're a bit darker, the ambient occlusion at the bottom where there is no light getting to it, um, the darker shadow under the leaves, that little dark spot there, and the darker edge. I'll overdo it. I use a big, big square blocking brush for doing all this sort of thing. I'll overpaint it and then I'll just go back in with the soft round brush and clean it up to where I feel it looks right. There's nothing wrong with going, doing this process and 90% of people do use this sort of process. You don't get everything right at once. You, it's adding and removing and you get that nice balance. adjusting my brush bigger and smaller to make sure the values are right in each area. Now moving on to the stem, same thing, I've added a clipping mask. I'm just going to clean it up a little bit because it's a bit rough. Now that's cleaned up, I'll go on to the next um, layer, which is the clipping mask layer. And I'll start adding the different values. The reason we use these different values, it creates form. This is how you make the object come alive, become a 3D object on the page. If we don't have shadow and light, it's just going to be flat. So it's really, really important to learn this. Values are absolutely vital. Same thing with the leaves. I'm looking at the shapes, looking at where the lights and the darks are hitting, adding and removing. If you feel you need to knock the opacity down a little bit on a one of the layers, go ahead and do it. Or if you find that a different layer mode works for something, like adding light, adds a really, really great, really great layer mode in Procreate that it's probably one of my favourite layer modes for adding light. But you have to tread lightly. <laughs> you can really overdo it quickly but it's a beautiful, beautiful way to add light. And I'll do that later in the piece, not quite yet. See the reflection down the bottom there? Look how it's bouncing back, the light's bouncing onto the table surface and then back onto the apple. It causes that reflection down the bottom. It's called bounce light. Again, Erasing it with a soft brush, making sure I just get enough without going overboard. 
I actually ended up using screen for that to add light there. And I adjusted the opacity and and I used an add layer on top of that for the brighter specular light. And a texture brush then just to knock back the a bit of it, just to give it a soft texture. Now I'm using the same technique on the stem, adding a bit of light to the stem. See how now it's coming round, it's starting to look like an apple, not just a flat, flat round circle on the paper. It's starting to become a three-dimensional object that you feel you could pick up and and hold, you know, which is the objectivity of it all. We want what we draw to come alive on the page. Going backwards and forwards, any little reflections and things that I want to add, I just go back and add to the layers. At this stage, I'm not adding a ton of texture, but I'm adding a little bit because I really like texture and I think it does a lot for you, for paintings, it really does. It, I don't like the flat airbrush digital sort of look, it's not my, my style, I guess. I like a bit of texture and grit to it. So as we go along, I'm just adding a little bit here and there, refining any shapes that I feel need some refinement. And the leaf there wasn't quite, quite right. I'm sorry, I've got a really husky voice, I've got a bad chest infection and it's making me very husky. <laughs> so that's, that's all observation, just really take your time, look at your reference, whether it's a photo reference or whether it's a still life reference, something that you're drawing from life, which is a really, really great way to work. There's nothing better than being in a studio and working from life models and even still life um, objects and things set up with nice lighting. It's, yeah, <laughs> takes me back to my art school days, which were amazing. We had some really amazing life drawing classes and things back then. But nowadays we've got the luxury of photos and the internet and it's all so easy. We don't tend to draw from life like we used to. Which is fine. But just make sure the reference photos you're using are well lit that they haven't been photoshopped a lot. When I say photoshopped, they haven't had a lot of added lighting. And also, you want a nice light and shadows, natural sort of lighting. A lot of the studio lighting you see done by photographers, they'll blow out all the shadows trying to keep the models looking absolutely perfect and their skin absolutely 
perfect with no lines and no wrinkles and all the lighting that they put put on them eliminates all the shadows that as artists we want, we need. We need to make our subject come alive. We need to have those shadows and the lighting. So just keep an eye out for that when you're looking at references. Here I'm just using a speckle brush to create a bit of texture down the front of the, the um, table. Again, I go overboard and then I knock it back with a soft round brush and adjust the opacity. I think I used the multiply layer there. Merging layers where I need to. Adding some texture to the apple. And the skin's not perfect. Has you know the little lines going around it. I just use one of my hairbrushes to do this. Really work perfectly. And again, knock back where I don't need it with the soft round brush. And less is more. You'll be surprised how much difference it makes. Even though it doesn't look like there's a lot of texture on it. There's enough. A speckle brush doing the same thing. Giving it some character. All these brushes are available in my portrait brush pack. The cube brush, I'll add the link at the bottom if you're interested. Even though they're for portraits, I mean, I use them for everything, not just portraiture. As you can see, this little apple. I've got a few blocking brush brushes that have texture in them and they're really good for this sort of thing just adding a adding detail without using tiny little brushes they're just beautiful I'm just Merging layers, so I haven't got 50 million layers. Blending a little bit. I didn't do a lot of blending in this, there was really no need to. I don't like to blend if I don't need to. I like the brush marks. Now we're going to go into colour. So I've changed the reference back to colour. All I did is revert it from the grayscale image. And I'm adding on top of each layer of each sub or each object. I'm adding a layer, adding a clipping mask, making a clipping mask, and changing it to color. So every layer is a color layer. I like to start with color, get some base colors down on each layer, then I'll merge them and start to paint on top of that, as you'll see. <coughs> Just got the collar wheel out, make it accessible. Start looking at the colours. My big blocking brush, which is my favourite brush.
I'm just trying to find some nice colours for the back of it. Just give it a bit of a tint. It doesn't have to be exactly the same as what your reference is, but if you're doing a photo study, try and stay close-ish to it. The idea is observation and being able to paint what you see in a photo study. So, But that doesn't mean you can't make um, choices, calculated choices. Not mistakes, but actual choices that you make. You want to change colour slightly, go for it. So long as that's a choice you've made and not a mistake. So I'm just choosing base colours that I feel work correct, work right in this. Just a basic red and green, brown for the stem. And a little bit of yellow to the top of the apple and the side of the apple. the base where it's getting that reflection back. I wanted to add a little bit more reflection there so I was fiddling around with some different layer modes but in the end I just went with colour. beauty of the colour, um, colour mode is it adds a colour to your image but it doesn't change the values it keeps pretty much the values beneath that you've used but it it can also make an image look really flat uh, here I made a mistake when I was um, merging all the layers down I forgot to add a base layer. If you don't have a base with a whole image on a normal layer and then you drop colour or multiply or other um, layer modes onto that, it won't drop correctly. It won't drop the way that you expect it to. It needs to have that normal layer beneath and then it will drop on top of that and be what you're expecting to see. I hope you can understand that, sorry. I don't think I explained it very well. But now I'm starting to paint on top of my base. I decided I wanted to brighten the apple up a bit because it was a bit flat, which can happen when you're adding colour like that onto grayscale. It's never as vibrant as painting from colour straight away but with these little tricks it will become as vibrant and as beautiful as if you painted it from colour from the beginning. Just looking at the colours and observation, the same thing as the values Look at the colours and add them where you think they need to be added. This is when it'll start to really, really come to life. It's fun.
just adding some hue shifts and again adding and removing giving it you know n no object is made up of one color unless it's something that's man-made I should say no natural object is made of one color in everything in nature there'll be hue variations anything that's alive whether it's a vegetable or a person or an animal there's beneath the skin there's different things going on there's blood or there's pulp in the fruit or there's there's a lot going on and it creates all these variation of hues so when you paint something really really look really look at all these different hues and different colors and and use that don't just paint a red apple red a red apple has orange and green and yellow and reds and pinks use all of that because it really does make a hell of a difference and this is what I'm doing I am just adding and removing colour where I think it needs it this is on a add layer I believe yep see how it's starting to really look like an apple look like something that's alive and you can bring your reference into procreate and color pick from it but I don't, uh, it's a tool it's a tool like any other digital tool but in my humble opinion I don't think it's a very good thing to do when you're learning I think when you're learning it's a really really good thing to learn to see the colors to learn to be able to pick the colors yourself and you won't do that if you're just doing it with an eyedropper if it's a job where you need to get the colors correct and it has to be cohesive I'm all for it and when you've already picked a lot of colors and you've got a lot of hues going and it's making some extra colors yeah color pick from the image but when you're initially laying down the colors try just really try and choose these colors yourself you can do it it just takes practice that was just adjusting the apple I felt it was a little bit squished it just needed to be a little bit higher Sorry, I was answering my daughter's text. I really should have scrubbed this bit out, shouldn't I? It's very slow. All right, here we go again, hopefully. Anyway, while well, this is, while well, I'm doing whatever I'm doing, um, to set up your canvas, I suggest that you set it up at the size you want to print. Um, 
or think you may want to print, even if you aren't going to print it. It's always good to have it saved as a printed version. And always at 300 dpi, minimum. I know other people say you can do it at 150, but if you want really nice, crisp, good-looking prints, don't go under 300. You don't need to go up to 600 or anything like that unless it's specified in a job you're doing. 300 is perfect at the size that you're looking to print, or as close to the size. If you're doing billboards, of course you can't do billboard size canvas in Procreate, but you can do a large canvas size that can be enlarged because you've created it at 300 dpi. And then you can just take it into a program like Alien Blow Up, Blow Up I think that's it, Alien Skin Blow Up. It's a really great program for upscaling any images. Keeps all the um, details really beautiful and crisp. And here we go again, finally. Sorry about that. Maybe not. This is my problem when I start. Oh, here we go. Now I'm just checking out the details, the little highlights, specular highlights. The illustration's pretty much finished, all the base work. Now it's just adding all the little details to take it that extra, extra way, extra bit. And it can be fun. And it does make a difference, especially when you're viewing it in large scale. Not so much if it's being looked at on a phone or something, but it's also good practice. I'm sorry. This is what happens when I record the whole screen. That's why I like the Procreate recorder, because it only records what you're actually painting. Not all the time that you get caught up and go and talk to someone or end up on the phone or go and walk the dog and forget that you've left the screen recording, or which I do a lot. Like here. Oh, I don't know. What about, oh, here we go. Oh, God. Huh. How about... Or you paint you, anyone who uses Painter as well as Procreate. I'm doing a webinar next week with Corel. Oh, here we go. Woohoo! I'm using my one of my skin texture brushes to add some more texture, colour, light. back to the webinar. If you'd like to join, I'll leave the link down the bottom. You can go to painterartist.com and look down the bottom of the page under webinars if you like. If you don't have Painter, it's a Mac or PC program and it's amazing. It's literally like having a art store at your fingertips. The brushes are so traditionally beautiful and oily and acrylic-y and pencil -y and charcoal -y and watercolour-y. They're just unbelievable. It's one hell of a program and it's my favourite. If you have a PC or a Mac, you can download a 
30 day free trial and try it out if you've never tried it. Unfortunately for those who only have iPad, there's no iPad equivalent to it. Now you can see I'm still adding details. One of my hairbrushes and just adding the little styrations around the fruit. Notice how I'm not just drawing straight lines, I'm drawing them round so it's following the curve of the apple. If I just drew it straight up and down, that was a mistake, sorry. If I just drew it straight up and down, you'd lose the roundness effect, lose the form. Still just adding and removing with the details, that's pretty much what it's all about. And I'll just keep going with that until I feel I'm really happy with it. Um, making sure that everything's tight, that the shadows are right. It doesn't look a lot, but it really does add a lot to the image. I decided to clean up the edges a little bit. They were a little bit, a little bit off. Now what I'm doing here is I'm fading the back edge of the apple. This is to make it appear to recede into the distance a bit and it's a really good trick to use I've added a layer mask onto my apple layer and now I'm going to paint with um, black or with grey if you use grey it doesn't remove everything it just removes a little bit so I'm just trying different greys I don't want it to be the edge to be removed I just want to soften it soft edges and hard edges are very important in an illustration soft or lost edges um, are for areas that you want to recede into the background areas that aren't as important where you want to direct the eye away from your harder air edges you want to keep those for the foreground closest focal points so the edges of the apple at the front are kept very crisp and clean but that back edge up the top there I've just softened it just so it's looking like the apple is going back into the distance and of course when you've got more objects if you're painting a landscape for example as you go further and further with mountains the softer and softer they become that's because of the atmosphere and all the particles in the air it's like a veil in between each object that we see that gets thicker and thicker the further away. And now I'm just finishing up with a few more details. Anything that I think will add a bit of interest to the image. <coughs> Excuse me. using that soft brush and a really big size to erase there we 
everything just has its own little bit of texture. It's not a lot, just a little bit. I haven't done any of these for a while, so sorry if I'm a bit, a bit rusty. I'd love to hear if, if you want to see more of this sort of thing, if you want to see more of painting more basic objects, um, longer longer videos with me giving you a narrative um, I was told recently I did a time lapse and I asked people if they were useful and everyone said they were great but they weren't really useful because they were too fast and they didn't get to really see what was going on so this is the first of many videos I'll be doing where I'm making a conscious effort to make the videos useful for you because it's no point me making them they take time and um, effort you know that I could be putting into painting and if they're not going to help anyone that's that's not the point the point of me making these is to pass on what I've learned over the years to you guys so that you know you can follow your dreams and it's what we should all strive to do as artists there's so much to learn and there's so much we can share each other, to each other it's a lifelong journey and yeah that's what I hope to do and I hope it helps someone gives someone some benefit now I'm really just finishing up these are all last minute checking everything spot on um, just cleaning up edges making sure that it's flat down the bottom Planning all of my layers. And I'm sharpening them. I like to do this. I think sharpening adds, adds a lot to the image. And that's it. It's all finished. I've added the time lapse on the end of this. I don't know why. I just thought maybe you'd enjoy watching it at a quicker pace as well I really hope that this has been helpful and I'd love it if you could give me some feedback would really appreciate it take care and be kind to each other and I'll hopefully see some of you at my webinar and I'll see you back here very soon peace out kids